Welcome to the first stage of Women Challenging Expectations. I'm Richard Sheath, the current president of the Ephemera Society of America. Next March, our entire conference program on the subject of Women Challenging Expectations will be offered online. Today's two presentations are also on that topic and are offered as a preview of the full conference coming in March. Today, we will enjoy two interesting presentations. The first on much celebrated globetrotter Nellie Bly, the second on, of all things, Victorian women's underwear. The Ephemera Society of America is a nonprofit organization formed 40 years ago. Our members are collectors, curators, museums and other institutions and researchers. Our mission is to cultivate and encourage interest in ephemera and in history and to serve as an umbrella organization for collectors, dealers, institutions, and scholars. A de definition of ephemera for those of you who may not be familiar with the term can be found on our website, ephemerasociety.org. In a nutshell, ephemera are written or printed items which have been created to serve some specific purpose and were not expected to be retained or preserved, but for one reason or another have been. It turns out that ephemera provides rich primary source historical and social information. Normally the society sponsors a major annual event that includes a conference, exhibits, an exhibit fair, workshops, student presentations, collective forums and auction and other uh, related events. This year is different. As in all current walks of life, we have been working hard to bring ourselves up to speed in this new online only world. Today will be our first virtual outreach. Without much more ado, a couple of points. The support of our patrons and donors, and now you online participants is particularly important to us. Our annual in-person conference provides regular income that allows us to pursue our missions now, online, we are offering presentations without any fee requirement. Please do consider going to ephemerasociety.org and clicking the button to make a support donation in whatever amount you choose. Support is critical to us. Finally, a couple points about the mechanics of today's presentations, please. If you wish to submit questions for the Q&A sessions to follow each talk, use the Q&A function on Zoom, not the chat function. Board member Mike Pike will be monitoring all Q&A questions and will pass along as many as possible to each speaker after each talk. Also, the raise hand function will not be activated today. Again, not chat, not raise hand. Thank you. So here we go. Our first speaker today is Brooke Kroger, who will be highlighting the accomplishments of an extremely capable and self-sufficient 19th century woman known as Nellie Bly. Ms. Kroger, take it away, please. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and I hope this all works. Uh, here we go. So I'm going to take us through um, you cannot share a screen while the other participant is sharing. Can whoever is sharing kindly stop? Are we good? Can someone tell me if this is working? Uh, can someone? Okay, thank you very much. All right, so we're going to talk about Nellie Bly, who may be familiar to you because she is uh, the subject of a lot of ephemera. I'm gonna go very quickly through her life and um, tell you as much as I can and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. I know a lot about her for two reasons. First, because uh, as a girl of 10, like many, many women journalists across this country, I read a juvenile biography about her and decided I didn't have to be a nurse and I didn't have to be a teacher and this is something I would love to do. Uh, and then secondly, I had a daughter at 10 who I encouraged to read that book. In those days, we had to go through the antique trader to find the books, which were long out of print. And a second book came up and it was very clear that these two juvenile books did not agree on any of the central facts of her life. So um, my daughter at 10 said, mom, you should write that book. 
and I did. So it's, uh, it remains now all these years later, the only full biography of Nellie Bly, warts and all uh, through documented primary research. So here we go. Um, she starts life in Cochran's Mills, Pennsylvania, which was named for her father, who was a judge, the postmaster and owned the local mill, hence Cochran's Mills with no E, which she added later. She is in the second litter of Judge Cochran's children. The first one had 10 children. His wife died. He married Nellie's mother. Another five children were born. And she is the third of the five, but really the alpha. Uh, so she's in line down the line, which will matter in a moment. Um, after about a year of marrying Mary Jane, uh, Judge Cochran and she buy three acres in nearby Apollo, Pennsylvania. This is Western Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. And they build this beautiful house. And then the judge un unceremoniously dies. He was quite a bit older than Mary Jane. And Excuse me, Brooke, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, why is that? Is yours off? Yep, can you try to share it? Well, I shared it and you knocked me off. <laughs> you try to share it again? I will certainly try, just one sec. Um, are you off now? Yes. Okay, uh, okay, let's try again. Uh, is that it? Have you got it? Uh, you need to do in the presentation mode. There you go, presentation. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, I will, but can you see it? Yes. Okay, great, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna whip through this again. Oh, are we good now? Yes. Okay, here we go. So here's, here's the old Cochran house. They moved to Apollo, Judge Cochran dies. And of course there are 15 children and a widow who's entitled to a third of the interest, which is you know basically nothing. So the family is almost in penury. They move the five children to Mary Jane and she moved to this very much smaller house in Apollo for a short time. And, um, and then Nellie is sent off to normal school in Indiana, Pennsylvania, also not very far away, but she can only stay one semester because, and she doesn't even finish the semester because her funds run out. Now, whether this is because her mother was spending them because her mother needed to, or there just wasn't that much money is not known. But in that period, Mary Jane, the mother has married this terrible drunken lout named John Jackson Ford. The marriage is brief, the divorce is not so brief, and it involves uh, Nellie, who is known as Pink, uh, for reasons that she just was more sparkly than most young girls of her age, testified at 14 years old at this hearing. And here's just a snippet. Ford threatened to do mother harm. Mother was afraid of him. I've seen Ford throw the clothes after being washed and ironed on the floor and throw water on them. I've seen him upset the table. He's a table flipper. The first time I've seen Ford take hold of mother in an angry manner, he attempted to choke her. There's another story that there was a party in town at one of the halls and he came and he dragged her out. I mean, he was really not a good guy. Um, so the family moves on to Pittsburgh. In the first few years, between uh, 1880 and 1885, till Nellie is about 20 something. Um, she's babysitting, she's helping her mother with the boarding house she's running to make a living. The two older brothers are making their way, but they're ne'er-do-wells. I mean, it's really Nellie who takes on the responsibility for this family, which is interesting of itself because of course this is 1880 when Victorian girls don't do such things. She reads the local papers, one of which is the Pittsburgh, no H at the time, Post-Dispatch. And there's an article by a columnist known as Erasmus Wilson, the quiet observer, as he is called in the column. And it's called, What Are Girls Good For? And he harangues about these women who are young women who are taking jobs away from men. And why should they be doing this? This exercises Nellie to such a point that she writes a letter to the dispatch and she protests this column and gives several really compelling arguments for why this makes no sense. The most important of which, of course, is that some girls have to help their families earn a living, which is something she knows firsthand. Well, the most amazing things happens. And of course, it is the first of many, many amazing things that happen to the amazing Nellie Bly. 
what happens is that the editor, George Madden, is so impressed by the letter, even though it has no grammar, no spelling, no punctuation, and not a lot of style, but he sees something special there, probably in the argument, probably in the personality. So he runs an ad. She had signed her letter, Lonely Orphan Girl, and runs an ad under that title, Lonely Orphan Girl, and asks her to come forward. If the writer of the communication signed Lonely Orphan Girl will send her name and address to this office merely as a guarantee of good faith, she will confer a favor and receive the information she desires. Well, what she receives is a job offer. And so Nellie goes to work for the dispatch. She's full of ideas about what to write about. Now at this time, women are, you know, I wouldn't say prevalent, but they are common in newspapers and they have been much to uh, the misunderstanding of most people since about 1840. What they are writing mostly is either correspondence, that's at the top of the field, which means they're coming from Washington or elsewhere uh, in the world or uh, the country, or they are writing about bloomers and you know women's fair. Uh, none of them doing this enormously happily, but it's the work that they can get. So Nellie starts out with bigger ideas. The girl puzzle is where she uh, talks to uh, what, what, should be happen, what should be happening to the daughters of Mother Eve. She writes an article about divorce, mad marriages. Guess where she got that idea? She goes to the workshops, the factories, to see how women are faring, the workshop girls are faring. And this is really significant because by going to the factories, Nellie, of course, goes through the management as you know, a young reporter might. She asks for permission to come. She gets a tour. Well, when you're being toured by the management, guess what you're getting to see? Not what a real reporter would like to see. So I believe this is the genesis of a lot of her later undercover work, where she understood that if you really want to find out what's happening. I mean, the stories are so you know, PR-ish, it's, it's kind of a shame, though every once in a while there'll be a snippet about a child laborer where it'll only be an exchange of, of chat, you know, nothing more substantive than that, but signaling that this was a problem. Very typical Nellie. So she's doing all right, but she really wants to, you know, it's not enough just to get her name in the headlines as you can see happening in that fourth piece. She wants to do more. So she's seeing, I think, in New York, other women uh, of even an earlier period, Grace Greenwood, et cetera, Gail Hamilton, are getting to you know, write in a way that really makes them important. So she figures the smartest thing she can do is go to Mexico, which she does with her mother as chaperone. They stay six months. And she reports. And every day, every few days, there's a headline of Nellie in Mexico, which is She's not the only one doing this, but it's an important way to say, I am in the top tier. I am someone doing the real work, uh, which most women really were not doing. There were columnists, but they're really writing on women's themes for the most part. She comes back from Mexico and thinks that she's gonna be made on the Pittsburgh Dispatch, but guess what? No, um, they got her writing rubber raincoats and theater criticism and flower shows and things that really, really are not what she is after doing in the world. So one day she leaves a note on QO's desk. They have become tight friends at this point. And she says, I, I imagine this is apocryphal. This appears in one of QO's columns, but it's too good not to repeat. I'm off for New York, look out for me, fly. And off she goes, uh, this is of course City Hall, and then you see Park Row as it was starting to develop at just about this time. We're now in 1887. That would be the New York World Building and the other, this is all newspaper buildings along the side of City Hall. Um, so what is she gonna do to make her way in New York? Knocking on every door, nobody wants her. I mean, she is not the sensation she had hoped to find herself to be. So she's talking with uh, a seasoned reporter who takes her on to mentor her. And he says, what you need to do is go interview every big editor in New York and get them to tell you what place is there for women in New York journalism. So she does this, of course, she gets into every office, which is basically a calling card. And um, sure enough, she picks up a lot of very good tips. 
John Cockrell, for example, of the New York world, the place you would really like to work. This is Joseph Pulitzer's relatively new paper. And it's, you know, it's the place to work. And um, he says, you know, what girls need to do is come with ideas, come with talent, come with, you know, willingness to do things. So that's exactly how she presents herself when she goes back to the world to present ideas. Her idea was to travel steerage from Southampton, England to the United States, because of course, this is the period of great immigration. And she wanted to understand what was it like for someone to cross the Atlantic in steerage. Well, they thought this was too expensive and too dangerous. But the summer before this happens, this is September 1887, there have been articles in the paper about some sort of nefarious doings on Blackwell's Island. For those of you who know New York, that is Roosevelt Island now, uh, just a, you know, in the middle of the East River, sort of across from the UN in that area. And um, this is where all the cancer spots of modern Manhattan, as, as one guidebook put it, were housed the insane, insane asylums, the almshouses, the prisons. I mean, everything was there just clustered together, including uh, the women's lunatic asylum. So how were they going to find out if nurses or doctors were mistreating patients or if anything else was really untoward going on? The only way, and of course, Nellie knew this from her workshop experience back in Pittsburgh, the only real way was to go undercover and get committed as an inmate which she does. So this is her very first job in New York. She has two years basically of experience in Pittsburgh with the six months in Mexico. I mean, in journalism terms, this is a baby, but she teaches herself how to seem mad. She checks into a boarding house in the East Village, what is now the East Village, and she convinces the matron and the, the guests that she's crazy. And so the matron calls the police and has her carted away, just as she hoped to do. She goes through a judge. They send her to Bellevue. From Bellevue, they send her across the river to be incarcerated at the asylum. There she spends 10 days. And of course, the, um, the paper had taken precautions. They had gotten her quashed legally because you know, you're taking the place of a real person who might need space, et cetera. So that had all been taken care of and they had a plan for getting her out. So an attorney and Walt McDougall, who was her cartoonist, her sketch artist, uh, went together to say they knew who she was and they claimed her. Now, why was that really possible? Because in those 10 days, every paper in New York was covering the, except the world, was covering the question of who is this insane girl who's calling herself Nellie Brown or Nellie Moreno. And, uh, and of course that comes from her Mexico um, sojourn. So she's there 10 days, she collects tons of material. She writes this explosive two-part series that runs over two Sundays in early October. It's a sensation. And of course, Nellie Bly is not her name. Her name is Elizabeth Cochran, but they're keeping that very much under wraps so that she can do more of these kinds of investigations. Now this is uh, the, not the start of, but it's at the beginning of, I would say. You know, every, I, I have to stop people from saying things are firsts because they're never firsts. But she's one of the, the initiators of what was called the stunt girl or uh, investigator movement, which really led to full-scale investigative reporting as we see from Ida Tarbell and the muckrakers who come along very soon thereafter. Nellie's was very personal. I was there, you can believe me, and really makes herself the center of the story she tells. But she does it with heart and feeling and a sense for the oppression of the people who are there and the ill treatment from the nurses and the terrible baths. I mean, it's really worth reading her Inside a Madhouse, which you can pull right off the internet. And, uh, and I won't spoil it for you because it's really worth reading. And you see, what she was like, why people were so fascinated by her instantly, instantly. And of course, every other reporter in New York, mostly the women just hated her. So um, the jealousy was rampant uh, because she became famous so quickly and she was able to do work of this nature. Um, as you can see, so this, this is like from the other papers, how they're talking about who is this insane girl, who is she? 
Um, so it was a it was a huge sensation for weeks. And not only that, it led to a grand jury uh, case. And then the uh, board of New York, the city council board went to go see what was happening. And of course, by that point, much had been cleared up, uh, you know, of course, because they knew they were coming, but um, it did increase the appropriation. So this is one of the first, not the first, but one of the first cases where newspaper work showed that it could it could affect social change, that they were able to have impact from their, uh, even their sensational uh, explanations. It's turned into an instant book, of course, uh, as many, many articles were in these times, a lot of women reporters and men reporters too would do correspondence, a trip to Europe, a trip to the Sierras and whip them into a book in no time. Nellie did the same. She was really on her way. I can't emphasize at 22 years old how remarkable this is to have this kind of notoriety so quickly. Um, of course, they were looking for more material from her. So she plopped together all of her Mexico material into a second book that actually comes out after the, uh, the asylum work. Um, and, then, uh, and then what happens? This I find extraordinary. Between the fall of 1887 and the fall of 1889, she does a zillion exposés. And a lot of these were you know, also very important and created a lot of sensation. Remember, there were newspaper exchanges in these days before the wire services. So a few days later, her stories would appear in other papers across the country. So her reputation was wide. Um, she did things on employment agencies that take advantage of low wage workers, trafficking in newborns, factory work for women, more of that, M matrimonial agencies, the lives of chorus girls and dancers, who she did not treat like trollops. She really made it clear that these were people who, um, who were making a living to help their families in many cases or to support themselves. You know, sort of the flip side of the coin, the question you didn't think to ask, she was answering. Orphanages, mesmerists and mind healers, or as my grandson would say, fakirs, he loves that word. Uh, physician fraud, going to five or six doctors with the same complaint to see how different the diagnoses were. Uh, her Albany bribers, bribery scandal report was huge and extremely important. She ran uh, the worst bribery artist fraudster in Albany out of town uh, by setting him up, which she did. Migrant workers, police matrons, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So her reputation by this point, she's a household name, a journalist who's a household name, who's not, you know, uh, Stanley and Livingston. I mean, she's a girl. And from those two years, a reputation lasts not only the rest of her life, which ends fairly soon, um, but to this day. And it's not from, you know, a 50-year career like Ida Tarbell's. It's really from about two and a half years, which I just find extraordinary. So what comes next? Nellie is after the next big thing. And for her, this is to go around the world faster than the fictional Phileas Fogg of Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. So she goes to her bosses at the world and she says, I want to do this. Well, they are already considering it, you know, how ideas can just be in the zeitgeist. So it's hard for anyone to really claim credit. Um, but she, um, she asks to go and they say they want to do it, but they'd like to send a man because how are you going to send a young girl? She's going to have to go with a round dozen trunks. Um, how is this possibly going to work? And she just simply responds in typical Nellie fashion. Uh, I'm going for another paper if you don't send me. So the world agrees in the course of like 48 hours, she has the cloak made. She gets the travel bag and that is all we are told that she traveled with. Um, as you see in this picture, she takes one change of clothes, uh, I think of undergarments, and, and that is how she is going to travel around the world. And of course, I'm sure most of you know a lot about this era. That is not how women or even men traveled. But Nellie does it. And off she goes. Oh, yes, here's the bag, uh, which I at one point owned, but now the museum has. So um, off she goes. So how is the world going to keep excitement and energy going about this trip for all the days that it's going to take because of course she's only sending you know short cables back 
every so often. So they run guessing contests and geography lessons. And I mean, just anything they can think of. Uh, and they keep doing this for the entire time she is gone. Uh, as you can see, guessing contests, et cetera. Uh, finally, she gets back. She ends up in San Francisco and the train barrels her across the country. It gets almost derailed in the Sierras. It's like so exciting, you cannot imagine. And she finishes in 72 days, six hours and 11 minutes. Now, unbeknownst to Nellie, the entire time she is going uh, uh, east, Elizabeth Bislin for Cosmopolitan Magazine is going west, trying to make it into a contest and to beat her. Um, she does, Elizabeth Bislin, needless to say, does not win and she is in the detritus of history for that reason, though uh, was appreciated as a journalist by many. This is so major, you cannot imagine. What does it generate? It generates a board game uh, that first appears in the newspaper and then is done by uh, more than one agency. Puzzles, uh, there's the board game, uh, one version of it. Um, here's another one. Trade cards, I've been schooled to say. Um, Nellie Bly lamps. Nellie by caps. These are two uh, provided to me by the society. Thank you both who sent them. I thought these were wonderful. I hadn't seen them. This alligator one is probably a Nellie hater would be my guest because she generated a lot of nasty gossip. Uh, people really were jealous of her. Of course, it's turned into a book immediately. Nellie is on the lecture circuit. She thinks she's going to be very rich, which really matters to her. Money has always been central to almost everything she does. She gets a contract with the family story paper. So she does, I, I initially thought only one piece and then that was the end of it. But uh, a subsequent researcher has found a whole cache of them in England. And now we know that she wrote several. They're all terrible. She was not a fiction writer. It was very clear. And that contract ends fairly quickly. And uh, Nellie is not going to be rich. So uh, this, this was the only book that came out of the family story papers. It was The Mystery of Central Park, which is a fictionalized version of a case she had done uh, for the newspaper while she was working all the time. Uh, there's a Nellie Bly cap that doesn't look anything like her cap, but you can see there were racehorses um, at the amusement park in Brooklyn. I mean, she was just a figure. And uh, so what happens? It's now 1890 and the money is running out pretty quickly. She has quit the world because Joseph Pulitzer would not give her any money, uh, no bonus for this incredible circulation bonanza she had created, nothing. And he said he was gonna have a medal struck, but he didn't even do that. So she's furious and very Nellie-esque, she quits. So what's she going to do? She gets an offer from the Chicago Daily News, which was a really ambitious, terrific paper of the time. And she goes out, she lasts only a month. On the train, it is said, she meets Robert Livingston Seaman, who as you can see, is a gentleman of a certain age, actually 40 years her senior, she's 30 by this point. And um, they marry. Uh, Nellie has the idea, I mean, he's someone who appears in Kings, New York. He's a personage. He lives on 37th Street, four doors down from where Eleanor Roosevelt is growing up in the shadow of the Morgan Library now. Um, she thinks uh, she's going to be financially secure now, which of course means also her mother and her sister and her brothers when they're on hard times, which is most of the time. So um, it turns out not to quite be the case. Yes, he owns uh, a big factory. He lives in that house with his brother, who's about his age. Um, she refers to it as bleak house. It's kind of a depressing atmosphere. She's taking herself out to dinner every night. He is hiring detectives to follow her. Um, Arthur Brisbane is her friend from the New York world. I think they were really just friends, but they were colleagues at the world. And then Brisbane, of course, becomes William Randolph Hearst's number two in his empire. And, and he, he will come up again and again as an important angel in Nellie's life. Uh, but he's giving her work because he really believes in her work. So he has her interviewing, doing some silly things like, you know, as an elephant trainer, but what a wonderful illustration. 
interviewing Emma Goldman when she's in the Tombs prison just before she gets sent back to Russia. Um, at the Pullman strike, he sends her there. And what does Nellie do? She's not covering the violence. She goes to the town of Pullman to see what life is like for these families who are in the, this distress. He, Brisbane just was enormously proud of this and often would come back to her to do other strikes because she could do things in such a special way. Um, this is her covering Tammany Hall, the tiger, of course, as it was called. So she did a lot of things like that. In 1904, Seaman dies. Uh, now remember her name is Elizabeth Seaman, keep that thought. And she takes over the factories. She has now gotten his will changed. So nothing's going to the nieces and nephews. Nothing's going to the brother. Everything is coming to her. But everything that's coming to her is in some degree of distress. And even though she has patents, she invents the steel barrel. She had a number of patents in her name. She ran this company as a model of social welfare. This is her steel calling card, which I love, uh, from the Pan American Exhibition. She had it made for that. And you can see that it's front and back, which I just love. And here's an article about her at the head of this big local industry uh, club. There's a club room. Uh, there's a, another room for a library. She gives turkeys at Christmas. I mean, she tries to make it a model of social welfare, which um, was of the times we're in the progressive era. Of course, that would be appropriate, but it also was her way. Nellie, from wherever she was standing at any given point, was always looking for ways to change the world at whatever level she could from wherever she was. Um, so then things kind of go bad. Uh, the factory is in financial distress. Her mother is suing her. Her brothers are suing her. Uh, there's questions of fraud. I mean, things are really not good. Um, let me stop a minute and tell you what this is. So this is Nellie in 1913 at the big suffrage parade in Washington, D.C. She was never a suffragist, but she was a fellow traveler, you could say, of the movement. She was you know, on their team to a certain extent. She'd also interviewed Susan B. Anthony. And by the way, her interviews of Emma Goldman and of Susan B. Anthony are both considered the seminal interviews of those two women, which is interesting. Um, she got Susan B. Anthony to comment on whether she prayed or not, things like that. Very Nellie-esque. Anyway, she was made a sentry in the parade and here she is in green riding togs thinking she looks pretty spectacular because of course they match her emerald green eyes. Nellie is always talking about her physicality. She's always talking about her million dollar smile and her wasp waist, which uh, doesn't stay wasp forever. Anyway, things go really bad. There are checks that you know have been signed that she claims she did not sign. Um, she's being robbed. I mean, she of course can get front page coverage in the New York Times because she's Nellie Bly, even all these years later. This, uh, this uh, front page is from 1911. Um, and then there are the suits. Mary Jane Cochran, that's her mother. Um, and Oscar Bondi uh, is who she put the name, the company's name in. He's a sugar refiner in Vienna, Austria. To flee prosecution, she takes off for Austria. Guess when this is? Well, it's hmm, 1914. And guess what's happening? War. So uh, as you can see, she's lost the wasp weight, alas. So she gets in touch with Arthur Brisbane, the war has broken out, and of course she's gonna go cover it. Nellie is the only woman to cover it from the Eastern Front. Um, she does harrowing coverage that is really fantastic to read and all for Brisbane, who is now at the New York Evening Journal. And as you can see, he gives it great display, famous writer in Austria for the journal, Nellie Bly on the firing line. Um, she does fantastic coverage for a little while because, of course, very soon we enter the war and she becomes an enemy alien. But she's not an enemy enemy because she's hanging out with the aristocracy and she makes herself useful in typical Nellie fashion by um, writing about asking aid for widows and orphans, which is pretty safe turf. Remember, there's a huge German population in New York who... Um, would be responsive to that. So those articles also run. And she does that until 1919 when she heads 
back to the States. She gets stopped in Paris. She actually goes to Paris because she wants to tell Wilson that the Bolsheviks are coming and that the country needs to beware. But at this point, people think of her as rather hatty. So this is a note dated February 25th, 1919 from the acting director of military intelligence to Captain J.B. Trevor in New York City from Paris. And he says, the following highly edifying paraphrase of a cable has been received by our office. And then it says, Nellie Bly is coming on the SS Lorraine. And then he says, although residents of New York, Mayflower descendants and original members of the Pilgrim Society will remember her activities, our files are not sufficiently antiquated enough to furnish this information. In other words, they saw her as sort of a hatty old lady and didn't take her very seriously, but they also decided even though she'd spent four years in Austria, she was not particularly a threat and that they would let her, um, they would let her come back into the country. So now it's 1919, what is she going to do? Uh, why it's Arthur Brisbane to the rescue again. And he, you know, he just admires her so much, which is I think very affirming considering the times because men editors were not accustomed to really being that great to their women employees. He gives her a column on the back page um, and he also uh, deploys her for uh, executions, for big sob sister trials, kidnappings, you know, any big sensation story, he still has her doing those. Um, and she does those for two years along, as you can see, Nellie Bly settles out of baby's identity. It's a very typical one uh, from the early period. Nellie tells how abandoned child, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Nellie seeks aid for mothers. So this is another thing she does. She uses the columns for like three themes. One is uh, against capital punishment. One is she becomes a clearinghouse for mothers who need to find homes for their children because they're chorus girls or because, you know, this is, as you can see, a life theme of Nellie and the orphans. And, um, and she really, places people, she finds matches and makes these places, placements, and even has one foster child of her own, not a foster child, but a ward, who she places in Connecticut, and who amazingly, I found alive um, with some dementia, but remembered everything from her early life. It was quite extraordinary. Um, there was that, uh, more of this sort of stuff. Oh, yes, and then Seaman, of course, her name is now uh, Elizabeth Seaman, and she, um, she makes the case for American seamen who are having their jobs uh, taken away by uh, foreign labor who of course are cheaper. And so those are the kinds of stories she writes. She dies in 1922 of pneumonia and a heart attack. She's 58, um, she's had this extraordinary life and Brisbane writes this amazing column about her um, to say that and ends with, in capital letters, uh, the best reporter in America, which I think he truly believed. Uh, and I don't know if I believe that, but close, close. So then what happens? She's dead, 1922, not another word. 1953, 54, these two books come out, The Minyan Rittenhouse, which I told you about, and this other one by Nina Brown that uh, convinced us that they've been piped. Um, Another 20 years pass, more than 20 years. And uh, it, it's discovered that she has an unmarked grave at, um, at Woodlawn Cemetery. And so the uh, New York Journalists Association decides to have a gravestone placed, which they do uh, in, in 1978. And then they establish a, an award, a Cub Journalist Award, which exists to this day called the Nellie Bly Award, which some of my friends have won, uh, which is lovely. So that's that's the mark for it. And then there was a Linda Pearl movie in the 1970s. My book came out in 1994, um, gosh, a long time ago. National History Day, good God, Nellie is a perennial. She is every year, whatever the theme is, somebody figures out that Nellie fits the theme and you know, she kind of does. So. Uh, I tend to be the National History Day uh, oral interview a lot. Um, Jason Marks wrote a book about the race between 
Nellie and Elizabeth Bislin, uh, my friend uh, John Englert, may you rest in peace. Goddard committed, he's from uh, uh, Western Pennsylvania, very near Cochran's Mills. And he got her, uh, her uh, place in the National Women's Hall of Fame. Um, she's a postage stamp, uh, which I got to uh, uh, give testimony on. Um, the American Experience did a wonderful um, uh, American Experience piece on her. Uh, that was like soon after my book came out. Matthew Goodman wrote a book about the 80 day trip, which is wonderful. Um, there have been a zillion children's books of any kind you want. I mean, zillions. And, um, and this is a terrible movie that I don't recommend, but you can find it on Amazon. Um, and then this was also not so great, though it had a great cast, unfortunately. There tends to be a, you know, a focus always on the madhouse. And I find her life so much richer than that. I mean, I think the Madhouse is a great story, but the whole person to me is, I don't know, just more important. This one hasn't come to fruition. Um, my book has been optioned now seven times and those never get made. Uh, this is wonderful. You can get this online. It's free. Nellie Bly makes the news. It's by a wonderful documentarian. It's all animated. Um, it's pretty delicious. And, um, and that's my story. I'm happy to answer any questions. Should I end the screen share or should I leave it up? Hi, Brooke, this is Mike Pike. Um, Hi, I would say leave the screen share up. Well, then you can't see me. I mean, if that's- Oh, that's that. Yeah, that's okay. even better. Oh, All right. Very good. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for your very informative talk. Uh, we do have some questions and answer, uh, some questions. Good. From our viewers. Um, and I'll begin with this one. Uh, can you tell me about the ironclad patent that Nellie received? Um, okay, I'm not a great expert in patents, but I can tell you that mm -hmm. she had several patents, the most important of which was for the steel barrel, because of course at that time wooden barrels were still almost exclusively in use and she invented a steel one uh, that of course was better for preserving. That's that's really all I know about it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, You've mentioned the two biographies that were written before yours. Were there other biographies or was that it? It was, I mean, this is an ephemera group, so you'll appreciate this. So when I wrote the proposal for the book, um, I had said that, you know, material seemed sparse. There were six letters at Smith. There were like two letters at Carnegie Mellon or you know, University of Pitts, I think it was Carnegie Mellon, you know, of course, P Pittsburgh, and, but like a few, like one or two. So I had about nine letters. Um, I mean, there was nothing, but there was this massive newspaper record where her name was in the headline of almost every story she wrote. So even though it ruined my eyesight by scrolling microfilm for 25 years, day by day by day, I was able to amass that record, but I had to do it by hand. And then, uh, of course, this is 1994, so the internet was, you know, 1990 to 1994, so the internet was not all that helpful. Um, and then I ended up with something like 125 letters, 122, I say in the book, I can't remember now, but, you know, it was substantive. Plus, she was so litigious, there was this massive legal record, even going back to the divorce of her mother at 14, which was, you know, an incredible find. And so I just was, you know, finding things and binding things. And then I went to Austria and all her reporting was there in the censor archive, Staatsarchiv, you know, I, I just found all kinds of stuff. So I was able to turn it into a book. Of course, there are some gaps and, um, but not as many as you might think, uh, simply because she was so personal in her writing that a lot of her, her written work really follows her life. And when you could, you know, correlate that with what you knew was happening at any given time, a, a fuller picture emerged. That's very interesting because um, I, I wonder about the 125 or 22 letters you found. Do they cover, a, do they cover her life or is it just... They, in, cover, they cover the things that I really cared about. Like, for example, when she's in the asylum, who's the one, like somebody... One of her old friends from Pittsburgh almost gives her up because 
he's there trying to find out who, who Nellie Moreno is. And then of course he knows Nellie from Pittsburgh. So she has to convince him not to give her up, you know, things like that happen. And that's all in letters to QO, which emerged. So there were, the letters were really helpful. Um, as few as they were, they were helpful. I mean, most people, you know, imagine what Robert Carroll works with, you know, presidential archives full of letters. So it was pretty sparse, but given that there had been nothing and that the fictionalized version of her um, was so off, you know, in some ways that it was, it, it, for, for those like me who really, you know, became journalists because of her, it was important to set the record straight. When the book was reviewed, and it was reviewed very widely, not because I'm anything special, I'm not, but because <laughs> there were so many women journalists who started the review with the words, when I was a girl of 10. I mean, there were so many of us who'd had that experience and still do. You know, it just, she, she ignites, she provokes, she inspires. And I notice it from National History Day, these 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds who are fascinated by her, fascinated by her. Um, so it, it just wasn't something just common to my era. It's, it's something that's still extant. Well, extending that, it seems as though your book has also had um, a very good effect. And as you showed us at the end of your talk, it has spawned all sorts of books and uh, movies and videos and, um, it, it I, seems to me that you've had, you've, you've paid that back. I paid it back. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was a labor of intense passion and think, you know, mysterious things kept happening. Like, like finding the ward, you know, which was just like miraculous and who hung up in my face till I had to go back because <laughs> she thought I was a prank caller. Um, and, and, you know, wasn't quite all there. God bless her. Um, there was, there were things like I'd open a phone book and find a phone number for Oscar Bondi, who ended up in the United States after World War II with his massive art collection that the Nazis had confiscated. And, um, and so I would find like in his will, the name of a nephew, Reese, who was his heir. So I'd find the Reese on Central Park West. I dial the number the number would change to a number in Westchester. I call the number in Westchester. The person would say, how did you get this number? We haven't lived on Central Park West for eight years. I look at the phone book. This is the days of phone books. It was an eight year old phone book. that was just happened to be the one on my desk. I mean, things like that just kept happening. How could you not love a project like that? So I guess the book contains that because it's so full of details. And also because there is no archive you know, no, she died alone, so nobody collected her papers, nobody created an archive, there are no heirs protecting her copyright. I mean, none of that occurred. So in a case like that, I felt like the book had to be the archive. So I have pages and pages of how to go find what I found, because I thought no one is ever going to do this again, ever, and I better help them, you know, make a path. So, um, I, I, you know, I feel, I feel good about that. I good. Do. Well, pick, uh, extending the archive uh, for a moment, uh, two of our listeners, viewers, have asked questions about, first of all, about the bag. Oh, the bag. You know, where did your bag go? What museum oh, has it? And another, another viewer wanted to know about the collection that you had. Okay. Kind of you had, a, you, from what I understand, had a substantial collection of uh, ephemera and well, uh, various things. And so what happened to all of that okay. and the back? I will tell you. So two books of mine, this one and a book about Fanny Hurst, who was a big short story writer and novelist and huge personality of the era just after Nellie. I was interested in trying to figure out what happened to women between 1890, when they'd already figured everything out, and 1970, when they had to figure it all out again because they forgot. And I was interested in what happens. So I'm sorry, this is a little uh, digression, but Nellie and Fanny are both second tier figures. You know, they're not the geniuses. They're 
huge celebrity personalities, which means they intersect with everybody who matters. So through them, you can really see a line of what is happening in an era. So in Fanny's case, I collected the calla lily stuff and you know all her kinds of things. It's sort of like having muses around while you're working. For Nelly, I had about two or three board games, trade cards, as I've been schooled to say. Um, I had the bag. Now, is it Nelly's bag? It's certainly the same bag, you know, whether it is actually her bag, it was sold as her bag. And I certainly paid enough for it for it might to have been her bag, because at that point, nobody cared so much about Nellie except me. The museum knew I had these things and the museum was just getting started in Washington. And they asked if I would give them on permanent loan. And so I did. And every year I would get a note to renewing. And then after about 15 years or so, they asked if I would make it a permanent gift. And I thought, sure, because they kept it in the vitrine. They did a video about her. You know, I felt like she was properly honored at the museum. And now, of course, in the last year and a half, the museum has closed. And uh, so it belongs to them. Where it is, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Well, that's certainly unfortunate. Um, for everybody. I had trade cards. I had the metal card. I mean, I had those sort of signal items. Yeah, yeah. Um, another question uh, that a, a viewer would like to know. Um, the question is, when Nellie goes abroad uh, in 1914 to, you know, relieve herself from her pursuers, her financial pursuers. Exactly. And she's there, she's there basically for five years. Yep, um, four years. Does, does, her, does her fame, because she's um, abroad, does her fame begin to decline a bit? That's the amazing thing, because of course, she's, first of all, she does war reportage, so no, she's there. I mean, when she returned in 1919, women like Ishbel Ross, who are the next generation of women reporters, will talk about, so they were, she was around at the time, so I would take what she says with some credence. She says that here she was in the newsroom with this chenille dot veil, you know, over from her hat, and she's kind of an eminence grise, no one, like they kind of know her, but she doesn't really talk to anyone. So her fame sustained in that sense, and, and I think you know, probably in the years after her death, the, the amusement park was there in Brooklyn. There were race horses with her name. So the name stayed in the zeitgeist. Um, and of course the name also is in the Mac the Knife song. I mean, it's the Stephen Foster song, which of course is where it came from originally. I forgot to say that uh, women often, not always, but often did not use their real names as reporters. Uh, it was typical to take a pen name. Um, and I forgot to mention that on the trip around the world, she went to see Jules Verne himself, which was great publicity for both of them. So there were many things that made her a name that stayed around, you know, in a way that uh, the names of many, many journalists will not. You know, remember journalism is ephemera. You're meant to disappear. So when you don't disappear, it's remarkable, you know, it's really remarkable. And she is one of those. Think of the names of journalists you can still remember. I mean, even names like Walter Lippmann who were, you know, just major figures of their day. If I say them to my students, they don't know who they are. They know Martha Gellhorn, but they don't know just about anybody else. I mean, that's um, just how it is. As a follow-up to the uh, museum question, <laughs> Was any of the material digitized? Uh, it has, is any of it available online? Or I did know, you know, we'd have to look and see. I've never done that. I was always excited every time I went to see the vitrine was still there and they hadn't, you know, gotten rid of the glass enclosure, yeah. with all my little doodads in it. Um, I was very proud of that. I'm kind of sad about that, I have to say. Yeah, yeah well, justifiably. Um, well, um, we must pause now uh, before our, our next presentation, but I will end by uh, reading to you what one of the questioners said, and that is simply super fascinating, Brooke. 
thank you. And thank, thank you very much. Thanks um, for asking me. I love to talk about Nellie. Well, your enthusiasm is quite evident. <laughs> uh, so we will be pausing now and return at four o'clock um, for our second talk. Thank you very much. Thank you Brooke, all. Brooke, we do thank you for what I think has been a truly exceptional presentation. And of course, Nellie herself is fascinating, accomplished, independent, uh, really uh, an, a, an unusual person. And I am so personally delighted to learn more about her. We will now take that few minute break and the next presentation will begin at four o'clock uh, EST. So see you then. Our second and final speaker today, uh, Barbara Rush, was a co-founder and a president of the Ephemer Society of Canada and is one of the few people ever to have been awarded both our prestigious Maurice Rickards, or Ricards as you wish, medal, and the British Ephemer Society's prestigious Samuel Pepys medal. Her topic will be the escape of womanhood from the restraints of Victorian undergarments. Barbara, we are ready. Thank you very much, Dad. Okay. So delighted to be with you all today, albeit virtually. And uh, it's wonderful that this new technology exists to bring us all together until the time when we can actually congregate together and hopefully in Greenwich, Connecticut next year. Well, Is that okay? So the Victorians, the word conjures up images of repressed sexuality, moral rigidity, and a smug complacency, and has come to represent all those fanatically righteous attitudes which the world has discarded once and for all. 
It was a time when women were regarded as either angels or seductresses. And the difference straddled a very fine line. In no small measure, their virtue became inextricably linked to their intimate wardrobe, both in the literal and metaphorical sense, the underpinnings of its social construct. We need only peel back the layers of deceptively frilly and seemingly innocuous apparel to understand how it came to represent the very foundations upon which Victorian morality hung. While women's lingerie ostensibly serves the purposes of hygiene, warmth, protecting the wearer's modesty, shaping the body and providing support, its implications are so much broader. Never was this more evident than during the 19th century. Victorian advertising, and especially the colorful imagery printed on the trade cards so widely distributed by manufacturers and retailers, are a particularly effective means of conveying the socio-sexual narrative of women's undergarments, reflecting and reinforcing the pernicious precepts of the prevailing popular culture. Like the role of women themselves, their unmentionables, the Victorians being too prudish to even mention the word underwear, saw an evolution throughout the reign of Queen Victoria between 1837 and 1901, when the dawn of a new age was about to begin. From crinolines to corsets, from bloomers to bustles, from petticoats to pantaloons, the changing fashions in personal garb coincided with evolving attitudes towards women and the role they played in society. Form and function were often at odds. An expression of the push and pull of class, gender, social exigencies and sexual constraints, much of it determined by and subject to the petty tyranny of the prurient Victorian male gaze. An examination of what lies beneath would be both instructive and revealing. This presentation will be illustrated in part with the age of ephemera from my personal collection. And I'll try to be brief. Sorry, I couldn't resist a little underwear joke there. <laughs> I've been a collector of advertising trade cards and other 19th century promotional ephemera for over 40 years and have an abiding fascination for evidence of the contradictory ways in which women are depicted in material culture. Idealized yet sexualized, idolized yet deprecated, queen of hearth and home, yet often circumscribed within its parameters. Nowhere is this contradiction more flagrant than on advertising promoting women's underclothing, essentially the gender war laid bare. During the first decades of the century, women's clothing was loose and worn fairly close to the body. But as Victoria's crown was placed upon her little head and the heavy robes of state were lowered onto her narrow shoulders for the first time, women were becoming enveloped in multiple layers of flannel, cotton and lace. Their concealed petticoats reflective of the outward indicators of wealth and material success which translated quite literally into extraneous material, up to 15 yards of it in circumference and quite as many pounds in weight, stuffed beneath enormously wide skirts. Swathed in yards of suffocating fabric, women were for all intents and purposes mummified. Though the layers of petticoats were more fashionable than the bandages of the ancient Egyptians, they, those they enshrouded were equally entombed. A description of 1856 reads, the underclothing of a lady of fashion consists of long drawers trimmed with lace, a flannel petticoat, an under petticoat, three and a half yards wide, a petticoat wadded to the knees and stiffened on the upper part with whale bones inserted a hand's breadth from one another, a white starched petticoat with three stiffly starched flounces, two muslin petticoats, and finally the dress. In addition to dragging up filth from the street, 
they were liable to be trampled on and awkward to move around while negotiating small rooms. They also posed a significant threat to the bric-a-brac which adorned the occasional tables in Victorian front parlors. Enter the crinoline. Considerably less cumbersome and heavy, though hardly taking up any less real estate. In fact, it widened the circumference of a woman's body by another few yards, encasing her in a virtual bubble of fabric. According to one contemporary fashion maven, the crinoline consisted of a light metal or whalebone structure in which hoops were placed horizontally, one above the other, and held together by curved ribs or by way of a complicated series of metal hinges. There are records of rubber tubes being used to form a bell-like framework inflated by means of a bellows and deflated to enable the wearer to sit down. Presumably one had to carry the billow, bellows around in order to reinflate the apparatus when the lady stood up again. Complicated process indeed, though no doubt an engineering marvel it did little to alter the fashion trend of the tiny waist set atop ballooning skirts. Essentially, the crinoline served as a gilded cage, while the woman, like some exotic fluttery bird, was held captive within. And yet, there was method to this madness, safeguarding a woman's virtue by keeping her limbs, not her legs, considered too provocative a descriptor, concealed and men along with their evil thoughts at bay, serving a similar function as the chastity belt of centuries earlier as a means of securing the property that belonged exclusively to one's husband. Nevertheless, inconvenience continued unabated as the new contraption gained momentum, becoming equally unmanageable as the petticoat of previous decades. Maneuvering through narrow doorways could be something of a challenge, while a ride on an omnibus could occasion disastrous, if comical, results. The satirical magazine Punch suggested somewhat facetiously that crinolines ought to be removed and hung on the exterior of the vehicle. While servants did wear a modified version of the crinoline, the expanse of skirt was very much indicative of the class wealth and status of the wearer. In both the United States and England, essentially the greater the circumference, the higher a lady's rung on the social ladder. But the consequences could be disastrous, if not tragic. Crinolines posed a very real danger to those who approached too near the fireplace, only to have all those layers of fabric go up in flames along with the lady enveloped within them. Just such a tragedy occurred to two half-sisters of Oscar Wilde, whose crinolines caught fire at an Irish ball in 1871, costing both of them their lives. 10 years earlier in Massachusetts, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's wife, Frances Appleton, died in much the same fashion, on account of fashion. But perhaps no other article of intimate apparel came to define the female form divine and the, royal, the role of women who wore it more than the corset. If the hooped cage that was the crinoline was a step up from the mummy's bandages of the petticoat, the corset with its tight laces and vertical stays reinforced with whalebone and steel was nothing short of an ambulatory prison cell. Though manufacturers emphasized the comfort, convenience, and improving qualities of its garments, in fact, the garment was a euphemism for that article of apparel, for the purposes of supporting organs, improving posture, and aiding in hygiene, they were as uncomfortable and inconvenient as may be imagined if not downright dangerous. A stifling and debilitating form of body armor, women found themselves clad within its constraints, not for their own protection, 
but on account of the insecurities and fears of the fragile male ego, their lives as proscribed and circumscribed as their waistlines. In an age when children were regarded as miniature adults, little girls as young as six or seven were subjected to the torture of the decorative straitjacket endured by their mothers, justified incredibly by its salutary effects. The notion being that if they were fitted out while they were still growing, it would be less painful by the time they were fully grown. The result was that the corset gained steadily in popularity after the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, where over 30 displays of various designs could be viewed. Far from being a healthful item of a woman's wardrobe or a mere slimming article of apparel, within its laces and stays lurked an entire sociosexual phenomenon. Like other restrictive Victorian clothing, it mirrored the repressive and inflexible society which promoted it. What was the rationale behind the pushing, padding, and compressing of a woman's body? Firstly, for the aspirational aristocrat, the corset was, like the crinoline, a guise of wealth. Since it made bending, stooping, and picking up extremely difficult, it suggested that those who wore it had servants employed for those functions. Further, it accentuated those areas of the woman's body which differentiated it from a man's. With the bosom raised up, the waist cinched, and along with the bustle the derriere emphasized, the result was the delineation of the hourglass figure, essentially creating a caricature of the female form with an enlarged bosom and pelvis, delivering a subliminal message as to a woman's fecundity and suitability for childbearing. The bustle it was in itself a kind of extension of the corset. According to legend, around 1870, the great couturier, Charles Worth, saw a servant scrubbing down the steps outside her master's house who had hitched up the back of her dress, bunching it up and tucking it into her waistband. He found the result enchanting, a voila. The latest fashion craze or craziness was born. The bustle consisted of a kind of padded steel cage projecting out of the rear of the dress. Early on in its evolution, extending <clears throat> down to the back of the knees, by the 1880s, this unsightly protuberance resembled nothing so much as an extended shelf upon which it was said a tea tray could be easily balanced. This is actually the title page of, <clears throat> of an exhibit that I have <clears throat> about all of these undergarments, which hopefully I'll be able to, <clears throat> to mount uh, <clears throat> in 2022. In, uh, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Hopefully we can all be together then. Well, in the 19th century, a woman's role was to set a moral example for society and to maintain the integrity of hearth and family. Within this cult of domesticity, she was adored as the light of the home and venerated as a mythological goddess. But women's virtue was a fragile commodity when she strayed beyond its prescribed parameters, she fell straight into the fires of hell. Thus, women were perceived as either goddesses or whores. To be tight-laced was to be respectable. To be unlaced was to be literally a loose woman, the original meaning of that phrase. Thus, a woman's virtue was compromised in equal measure to the loosening of her corsets and stays. Those who endured its agonies and subjected themselves to its indignities were admired, even worshipped. Contemporary advertising consistently depicted angels and cherubs alongside women in corsets, while those who chose to ignore its precepts were knocked off their pedestal and cast out from the acceptable social order into a social wilderness. And there was no middle ground. The corset became the determining factor 
and ultimate manifestation of respectability, the literal and metaphorical upholder, the standard bearer, if you will, of middle class values. But there was an ironic moral contradiction inherent in the wearing of the corset and the bustle. Because it so graphically delineated the lines of the body, it was also sexually provocative, ironically infusing a decidedly erotic, even salacious element into its use. The breasts were raised up over the bodice, especially in evening clothes, and with any heavy breathing, given that breathing was possible at all, would visibly heave up and down. Little wonder that women in love were thought to be so attractive. The ardor of which poets wrote with such reverence was more a result of the undulating bosom than of palpitating hearts. Not only were the products themselves titillating, so was the promotional material, especially the trade cards which depicted them. Discipline was a word often associated with the corset. The implication was that the mortification of the flesh, somewhat akin to a hair shirt, was somehow grist for the soul and helped contain an overzealous personality. And what mattered a woman's comfort and health when measured against her spiritual salvation? Well, sadly, the price paid for spiritual salvation and the demands of haute couture was nothing short of catastrophic. The tightly laced undergarments impeded respiration, misaligned the spine and ribs, and pressed in mercilessly on stomachs, displacing livers and other delicate organs. Some women, already strapped in, bound up, and locked down, went to even greater lengths to achieve the wasp waist effect by having their lower ribs cracked or surgically removed. The result of all this physical abuse was popularly referred to as female complaints, specifically fallen womb, leucorrhea, painful menstruation, and prolapsed uterus. Remedies for the consequences of the dictates of Victorian fashion once again recall the crudeness and brutality of the Middle Ages. Consider, for example, various treatments for prolapsed uterus, sponges forced into the vagina, injections of alum and water, the application of ferratic electricity, which was thought to strengthen the abdominal wall, tonics, whose main ingredient was alcohol or laudanum, effectively turning women into alcoholics and drug addicts, enemas, hip baths, and pessaries. Ah, the pessary. This was an instrument of torture which provided more discomfort and potential dangers than did the corset, the horrors of which it was created to combat. Constructed of metal, wood, or bone, it was inserted into the vagina for the purpose of supporting the uterus and female organs, which the corset had so effectively damaged. I wanted to show you this. These are actually glass breast cups for the purpose of protecting the clothing of breastfeeding mothers. That looks, uh, that looks very comfortable too. Just as the corset encased the bodies of its victims, the dispute over its merits and dangers encapsulated Victorian attitudes towards gender, class, and sexuality, and were pivotal to an understanding of a period defined by a set of rigid, unyielding, and immobilizing precepts dictated by the exigencies of the cult of female beauty. Essentially, the shape society adopted was determined by what lay beneath amounting to the enslavement of women, their bodies codified, objectified, and sexualized, their lives demoralized and degraded. In an age when they were beginning to assert their rights with regards to education, marriage, children, divorce, property, careers, and the elective franchise, women, shackled and incarcerated, were treated as though they'd committed a felony and sentenced to life behind bars without the possibility of parole. And yet another irony, 
Though it was men who dressed them up like porcelain dolls, women were nevertheless perceived as vain, simple-minded, or seductresses. Despite the rigidity, both physical and psychological, placed upon those who conformed to the restrictions and conventions of Victorian undergarments, there were those who had the vision and courage to defy them, and with their defiance enjoyed remarkable success and unheard of achievements. The Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood painted such women in loose-fitting robes and flowing gowns. A number of right-minded women, including Florence Nightingale, known affectionately as the Lady with the Lamp, heroine of the Crimean War, balked at the implementation of the underlying constraints placed upon women, which were entirely antithetical to her position on the role of women. Refusing to live her life in a cage, however gilded it might be, she wrote, a family uses people not for what they are, nor for what they are intended to be, but for what it wants them to be, for its own uses. If it wants someone to sit in the drawing room, that someone is supplied by the family, though she may be destined for science or for education or for active superintendence by God, that is, by her gifts within. Neither donning the crinoline nor sitting in a drawing room were viable options for the Nightingale, and she flatly rejected both. Her book, Notes on Nursing, helped raise money for her foundation, while she improved the sanitary conditions of hospitals and the workhouse, ran the Florence Nightingale Training School at St. Thomas's Hospital, where there's a wonderful museum dedicated to her memory, if you're ever uh, in, in London, and advocated for social reform. She single-handedly revolutionized the nursing profession for generations to come, and astonishingly, if somewhat ironically, accomplished all of this clad only in a nightdress, free of the constraints of the undergarments she so despised, in part because for much of her long life, she was bedridden with depression and a debilitating condition known as brucellosis. Other champions of rational dress included Amelia Bloomer, fierce advocate of women's rights, the elective franchise and the temperance movement. She was the first woman to publish a newspaper specifically for women called The Lily. Though she popularized the article of apparel which bore her name, it was actually created by a woman named Elizabeth Smith Miller, who in 1851 wore it on a visit to Seneca Falls, appropriately, and perhaps not coincidentally, the venue of the Women's Rights Convention, which had been held there three years earlier. Well, Amelia Bloomer immediately recognized the potential for these bloomers to free women from the constraints and folly of conventional fashion. Though roundly ridiculed for the radical garment whose name became synonymous with her own, Bloomer set the stage for the liberation of the female body. Though hardly a radical concept by today's standards, at the time, the garment was ridiculed as immodest and hideous. Men especially reviled the bloomers with their flaring skirts reaching below the knees, under which baggy Turkish style pantaloons extended to the ankle as an attempt by women to wear the trousers in the family. Once again, common sense was outweighed by the fragility of the male ego. Though they had their champions, bloomers quickly lost momentum. Long before celebrity endorsements, actress Lily Langtry, known as the Jersey Lily, as she hailed from the island of Jersey, lent her name to an eponymous bustle, which she described as an arrangement of metal bands working upon a pivot and advocated for its beneficial improvements and user-friendly attributes, though it doesn't sound awfully comfortable. Celebrated as the most beautiful actress of her generation and notorious as the mistress of the Prince of Wales, 
she was praised for her corseted figure, though fully aware of its insalubrious and deleterious consequences. Perhaps to uh, compensate for her capitulation to the demands of fashion, she popularized the invention of a comfortable and health-promoting woven fabric in underclothes. Named in her honor, it became known as Jersey. While her bustle has disappeared in the mists of time, her jersey endures, becoming also a commonly used fabric in men's long johns. By the 1890s, recreational cycling had become all the rage, providing a wholesome form of exercise in the open air. But for women, the issues revolving around the new craze were far more complex. Champion of female suffrage, Susan B. Anthony wrote, the bicycle has done more to emancipate women than any one thing in the world. I rejoice every time I see a woman ride on a bike. It gives her a feeling of self-reliance and independence the moment she takes her seat and away she goes the picture of untrammeled womanhood. Fellow suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton declared that woman is riding to suffrage on the bicycle, reported the Nebraska Courier in 1895. The bicycle has taken old fashioned, slow going notions of the gentler sex and replaced them with the new woman mounted on her steed of steel. At the opposite end of the gender rights spectrum was the Sunday Herald of 1851, which spat, I think the most vicious thing I ever saw in all my life was a woman riding on a bicycle and Washington is full of them. I had thought that smoking a cigarette was the worst thing a woman could do, but I've changed my mind. In fact, the very act of cycling became an instrument of change, an enormous cultural and political force, an emblem of women's rights, and something of a rallying cry for the entire suffrage movement. But this freedom of movement was to a large degree illusory. It soon became clear that corsets and stays were incompatible with cycling, the long trailing skirts becoming entangled in the spokes and gears while the tight lacing impeded respiration and endangered safety. One woman highlighted the very real danger in such journals as Sporting Life in 1891. I was skimming along like a bird when there was an awful tug at my dress and a crackling sound. Before I knew what was the matter, I found myself lying on the road with the safety on top of me. My dress was so tightly wound around the crank bracket that I could not get up until I got free. Cycling at last provided a hygienic validation for discarding excess and restrictive clothing, both inside and out. The result was the resurgence of the previously ridiculed bloomers, now acknowledged as more appropriate cycling attire. Nevertheless, like nearly a half a century earlier, bloomers were not without their detractors, nor was their return universally hailed. In 1895, under the heading, The Pneumatic Woman, the Freeland Tribune reported on a broken engagement when the young man ordered his fiance to dismount and return indoors to change into skirts or the marriage would not take place as he drew the line at bloomers on a bike. The young lady, a new woman in every sense, promptly removed the diamond ring and handed it back to him, stating emphatically that she would not discard her bloomers for anyone, for him or anyone else. Numerous sermons delivered from pulpits across the country exhorted women to abandon their sinful ways along with the indelicate and unwomanly conduct, making her despised in the eyes of all peoples of virtuous sensibilities. 
Indictments were equally harsh in the school boards as they were in the churches. In my collection is a handwritten document from Ware, New Hampshire, dated 1854, concerning a teacher named Susan, who was preemptorily fired for wearing bloomers to class. Such views were uppermost in the minds of the Board of Trustees at the College Point Seminary in Flushing, New York, when they decided in 1895 to ban teachers from riding bicycles to and from school. Though the ladies in question wore skirts, the board feared that if we don't stop them now, they will want to be in style with the New York women and wear bloomers. We're determined to stop our teachers in time before they go that far. Cycling, together with the indecent apparel associated with it, was, according to one board member, conducive to the creation of immoral thoughts. It seems little had changed since Susan's day 40 years before. Mocked and berated, the proponents of rational dress remained as undeterred as Susan had been. Nor was there a limit to their potential when liberated of their corsets and long skirts. As seen in this set of Duke cigarette cards, some women became trick circus riders like the Kaufman troupe of trick cyclists performing impressive and dangerous feats that would have been unimaginable in restrictive undergarments. But women accomplished far more than mere circus stunts when released from sartorial bondage. Taking off into the countryside in the company of young men allowed for a different kind of freedom previously denied young women severely circumscribed by chaperones and parental scrutiny. But with the loosening of restraints of both the physical and social varieties, there was a universal fear, mostly amongst the male population, that the new woman would also break free of her traditional roles as daughters, wives, and mothers. The stays of the corset literally had the effect of making women stay, at home that is, with husband and children rather than stray. There was fear that a woman who removed them for the purposes of riding a bicycle, embracing liberation and power, would lose her moral center, leading her into hedonistic lesbianism and terrifyingly out of the control of men. These stereopticon cards offer a satirical representation of the gender roles being reversed as men, subservient and emasculated, are obliged to perform the inferior domiciliary tasks of washing and caregiving, while their bloomer clad women folk discard their corsets, their skirts, and their domestic responsibilities. We can only imagine them pedaling off into the future and a world previously, un previously available only to men, now deprived of their role as head of household, their masculinity and superiority usurped. Note that the men's heads remained bowed in obeisance as their wives, flanked by their bicycles, tower above them. Regarded as indecent and vulgar, not since the broomstick has a mode of female transport been so demonized, vilified for its association with prurient sexuality, sedition, and the undermining of the male prerogative. The clear indication in this illustration is that women wearing bloomers and riding bicycles will be denied entrance into the pearly gates. And as predicted, with increased freedom of movement came an increased desire for freedom of expression, along with demands for equality with respect to education, employment opportunities, civil rights, and the right to vote. Unbound, women's participation in recreational activities mirrored their progress from the confines of the Victorian parlor to a larger world, leading to tangible gains inequality. In a sense, the path to women's emancipation began from the bottom up, from the top down, and from the inside out.
the predictions of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were coming to pass. In the days when removing one's corset meant risking one's reputation, there were those who were willing to put their lives on the line with it. And so it was quite literally with Maria Spelterini, who seemed to emerge from the mists of the Niagara Falls in the year 1876. Maria was the first and only woman to cross the Niagara Gorge on a tightrope. On July 8th, she appeared in flesh-colored tights, a tunic of scarlet, a sea green bodice and neat green buckskins. Superbly built, they wrote in the papers, she was admired as much for her physical attributes as for her aerial feats of virtuosity. Tiptoeing onto the gossamer web, she crossed confidently from the American side to the Canadian. On the way back, she danced in time to waltz music provided by brass bands stationed on both shores. Four days later, she returned for an encore performance. This time, she had peach baskets strapped to her feet in place of the green boots. In subsequent performances, she crossed blindfolded, backwards, and with her hands and feet manacled. After her final performance, she stepped gracefully onto the American side and disappeared into the mists of time. Truly, if anyone has earned the name Made of the Mist, it is Maria Spelterini. Her miraculous feats are recorded in photographs and stereopticon views. I'd like to step briefly myself into the Edwardian era when few had greater power to affect change when it came to women's fashion than the designers themselves. And few women affected that change more tangibly than the evocatively named Caress Crosby. Here she is with her equally evocatively named whippet, Clitoris. I, I can't make that up. <laughs> Married and divorced, and with numerous lovers and a distinctly bohemian lifestyle, as you may imagine, she was an avid patron of the arts, poet and publisher of the Black Sun Press, which promoted the early works of such literary luminaries as Ernest Hemingway and Henry Miller. She's now widely hailed as the creator of the first modern bra. Her groundbreaking, her groundbreaking invention came about in this way. For a debutante ball in 1910, she wished to appear in a sheer evening gown with a plunging neckline and a low back. Discarding her restrictive whalebone corset, she instructed her maid to bring her two pocket handkerchiefs, some pink ribbon, a needle, and a few pins. Et voila, the bra was born. Now able to move about un uninhibited in her backless garment, she created a sensation and was mobbed by the other girls at the dance, demanding to know her secret. She soon began manufacturing the newfangled contraption and in 1914 was issued a patent by the United States Patent and Trademark Office for the backless brassiere. Her design was lightweight, soft and comfortable to wear, separating the breasts as opposed to the mono bosom created by the corset, which was stiff and uncomfortable. She founded the Fashion Form Brazier Company and in an unusual move, conducted her own business using separate funds from her husband. Ultimately, she sold the company to Warner Brothers Corset Company for $1,500, the equivalent of about $2,300 in today's currency which went on to earn in excess of $15 million from the patent over the next 30 years. One of her ancestors was Robert Fulton, the developer of the steamboat. And years later, she wrote, I can't say the Brazier will ever take as great a place in history as the steamboat, but I did invent it. History might well record that millions of women disentangled from their corset stays would have placed the steamboat a distant second. 
Lady Lucille Duff Gordon took up the torch where Caress Crosby left off. Fashion maven to kings and queens, aristocrats, celebrated bohemians and stars of stage and screen. With Maison Lucille salons in Paris, London, New York, and Chicago, Lucy had very specific ideas about how Edwardian women should dress, which precluded the tight-laced heavy garments of the Victorian era. She envisioned light, floaty dresses, unrestricted by corsets and other cumbersome undergarments. Her luxuriously layered and draped tea gowns, formerly relegated to at-home wear, were liberated to out of doors, raising eyebrows and considered very risque. In her memoir, published three years before her death in 1935, she wrote, I was the first dressmaker to bring joy and romance into clothes. I was a pioneer. I loosed upon a startled London, a London of flannel underclothes, woolen stockings and voluminous petticoats, a cascade of diaphanous chiffons, gossamer light wisps of lace and shimmering silks in delicate color combinations, draperies as lovely as those of ancient Rome. Another of her revolutionary fashion firsts included a line of lingerie to be worn beneath her flowing tea gowns. She explains, so I started making underclothes as delicate as cobwebs and as beautifully tinted as flowers. And half the women in London flocked to see them, though they had not the courage to buy them at first. Introducing tight slit skirts and plunging necklines beneath which lay less restrictive corsets, she promoted the brassiere and pared down lingerie, dressing women from the inside out. And indeed, the, the clothes were so wispy and fairy-like they appeared to be worn inside out. She was the first to dismiss boned corsets and wired skirts, replacing them with provocative undergarments designed to heighten sensuality in women's dress, beginning with their restrictive underwear. She was innovative in other ways as well. The first designer to hire live models to strut the catwalk in her designs. She invented the mannequin parade, the forerunner to the fashion show runway, complete with a curtain stage, mood lighting, a string band, programs, and gifts. Her entourage traveled with her and became the world's first supermodels. She and her husband, Sir Cosmo, Duff Gordon became even more notorious as survivors under suspicious circumstances in the Titanic tragedy. Speaking of controversy, the actress Sarah Bernhardt courted it, thrived on it for most of her life. Search the dictionary for the word eccentric and you will find Sarah Bernhardt who traveled with her own coffin and an alligator named Ali Baba, who sadly died of an overdose of champagne. Here was yet another innovator, a glorious autonomous eccentric who had neither the time nor the inclination for the restrictions dictated by women's undergarments. And her decision to cast off her stays caused a sensation. I had been criticized and glorified, she wrote in her autobiography. Calumnies of all kinds, stupid and disgusting, foolish and odious had been circulated about me, saying that I had been sent by the old world to corrupt the new. Some people blamed and others admired the disdain with which I had treated these turpitudes, but everyone knew that I had won in the end and that I had triumphed over all and everything. Bound by neither protocol nor convention, she was a fearless exponent of classical proportions on stage. Not only did this allow for a fluidity of movement and gesture, which would otherwise have been impossible, it made her the world famous dramatist she became, enabling her to take on traditionally masculine roles 
unencumbered by the exigencies of the female form. She lamented the lack of intelligent roles for women, reveling in such tragic and heroic characters as Hamlet and others by such playwrights as Edmond Rostan, Victor Hugo, and Fred, Alfred de Musset, some of whom became her lovers. Oscar Wilde, who claimed he would gladly have married her, once asked her, do you mind if I smoke? Her response, I don't care if you burn. <laughs> in fact, dressing in masculine costume made her a leader of social, artistic, and political reform. How modern she looks in a pantsuit. One of the first actresses to don trousers on and off stage, promoting an androgynous persona considered scandalous in late 19th century Europe, while she's the first woman to appear in cross-dress in film. Revolutionary and transgressive, she defies all definitions of female achievement. One biographer wrote, her male impersonations had the sexless grace of the voice of choir boys, full of poetry and truth. A savvy businesswoman, she created Bernhardt merch, including medallions, fans, perfumes, paper dolls, and postcards featured in her most celebrated roles, and used the new technology of lithography to produce vivid colored posters. In 1894, she hired Czech artist Alphonse Nuka to design the first of a series of promotional posters for her play Gizmonda, expanding his designs to include theatrical sets, programs, costumes, and jewelry. In the process, Mirka's iconic posters came to represent the age itself, as did she, the graceful and sinewy incarnation of the Art Nouveau movement. On one of her eight tours to North America, she was persuaded to stand on the back of a whale which had been harpooned and beached in Boston Harbor and pull out a piece of whalebone from the blade of the poor floundering creature, which she describes in her autobiography as one of those little bones which are used for women's corsets. Shortly thereafter, posters were produced which proclaimed, come and see the enormous cetacean which Sarah Bernhardt killed by tearing out its whalebone for her corsets she was incensed. Firstly, because her name and reputation were being defamed while merchandise was being sold without her receiving royalties, but perhaps even more significantly, under no circumstances did she want her name associated with a product she abhorred. I never wear corsets, she fumed. In her later years, her leg was amputated falling, uh, following a fall on stage some years before, but she remained undeterred. In a letter dated 1916, shortly after her return to the stage, an American woman sends an eyewitness account of a London performance. Isn't she a marvel? I could not see how she supported herself on her wooden leg. I thought she looked very prostrated and tired but she acted with great emotion and tenderness. The motto by which she lived was a defiant men," which translates roughly as nevertheless or so what, but whose meaning comes closer to the sense of despite all adversity, with which she shrugged off all attempts to thwart or humiliate her. Along with Napoleon and Joan of Arc, she is regarded as the most celebrated native of France in history. And finally, Queen Victoria, after whom the age took its name, instituted the cult of mourning, which cloaked women within a black shroud for over 40 years. Though she was the most celebrated woman of her century with unlimited global influence, she chose not to loosen her stays until age, ill health, and obesity precluded. Though certainly no feminist, 
Her reforms, which allowed divorced women to be presented at court, were sweeping. She popularized the white wedding gown. But by far her greatest contribution to the well being of millions of women in night clothes was the introduction of chloroform to women in labor, which she herself had administered during her final two pregnancies in defiance of church protocol. This one act paved the way for women to give birth in less pain and greater safety while jumpstarting the entire science of anesthesiology. And like her second most famous pronouncement, we will not be dictated to, took her from icon to iconoclast. If the majority of Victorian women's garments, undergarments especially, were narrow and constricting, the chemise was by contrast anything but. A shift or smock intended for wear over the drawers, it protected the skin from the corset and the corset from the dirt and perspiration of the skin. Voluminous and amorphous, yards of fabric were trimmed or embroidered in wide necklines and hems, distinguishing it from night dresses, which generally boasted yokes, collars, and cuffs. And here is Queen Victoria's chemise presumably worn during the waning years of her life when her circumference exceeded her height, which was just under five feet. Throughout her 50 year reign, her 63 year reign really, her hosiery, but for 50 years, her hosiery uh, was uh, woven by one man named John Meakin, while a woman named Anne Birkin embroidered every design. And I don't know if it's visible here, but at the very top of, uh, of the stockings was her royal cipher woven, woven into the design. And she owned this uh, pale pink pair early in her reign before her beloved Prince Albert's death, when her world and her wardrobe turned to black. Drawers, known later in the century as knickers, were, like the chemise which covered them, enormous in size, consisting of two almost totally separate and open sections, one for each leg, joined and fastened by a waistband. Presumably, this large gap is for the purpose of answering the call of nature, beneath the stifling layers of chemise, corset, bustle, and gown. And these two uh, items, the, the drawers and the chemise and the stockings are three of the most uh, precious items in my collection. And here are two packages of Victorian toilet paper, uh, which were used precisely for that purpose of answering the call of nature. A pair of Queen Victoria's knickers sold at auction in 1977 were described in a newspaper report as resembling two great linen slings gaping open at the front and held together by a drawstring. This effectively describes the pair I purchased at a British auction some 10 years ago. All of these remarkable women and others whose names have been lost to history set their own rules, created their own style, and dared others to follow. Innovative and provocative, in their day they were revered and reviled in equal measure, challenging the self-contained, self-satisfied, male-dominated society of late 19th and early 20th centuries. Casting off the restrictive bonds and shackles of Victorian and Edwardian convention, they emerged unfettered, eschewing the traditional roles assigned to them, breaking new ground to become pathfinders, not merely challenging, but surpassing expectations, taking their rightful place in the pantheon of heroic womanhood. From what was once disgrace has become a certain grace, a shining example to us all. From the vision and courage of our self-liberating foremothers, 
Today's women enjoy the freedoms and fashion choices we have come to take for granted. Come in, despite all adversity. Thank you, everyone. Barbara, thank you so much. That was a, a very richly illustrated and an, an extremely interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'll begin by um, just reading some of the uh, some of the things people have said. Uh, wonderful objects, fascinating origin of the brazier, um, and then uh, one of the one of our viewers talked about the horror of seeing Oscar Wilde's sisters and um, Longfellow's wife um, in those. Uh, uh, images that you showed, um, which I guess kind of leads us into some of the questions related to the things that you, um, you presented to us today. And one of the first questions is, despite the restrictive nature of a crinoline, um, how were women able to dance in those things? It was, it was very difficult to do that. Uh, and th this was just the beginning, I think, of the time when the waltz was coming in. Um, you know, women, there was more or less a line dance uh, up until that time. So people were, were standing fairly uh, distant. There was a lot of social distancing going on <laughs> at that time. Um, and they couldn't get very close. And that was one of the illustrations that I used. A man was handing some refreshments to a woman uh, at the end of a very long stick because that was the, precisely the point that he couldn't get very close to, to uh, a woman. And uh, you know, one another thing I have in, um, in my collection is an invitation to Queen Victoria's wedding. And at the bottom of the invitation, it says, uh, women, no trains so that there were no trains allowed uh, at, at this ceremony and, and at this reception. And that was presumably because men were constantly stepping on women's clothing. And, and that was a very common thing. So I think that was pretty good that in 1840, uh, Queen Victoria decided not to allow women to uh, be trampled upon uh, at her own wedding. Well, um, you know, we flash ahead to uh, 2021 and 2020, and uh, people are using um, extended microphones to pick up speech. So exactly, uh, we're 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 doing social distancing again for for a quite exactly. different reason. But yeah, I mean they they were social distancing in the 19th century for different reasons. Exactly. Um, one of the uh, one of our viewers uh, commented commented about the fact that. Uh, beginning with uh, Florence Nightingale, the shift in women's fashion seemed to be a, uh, a shift away from uh, the social mores of, of wealthy people and, and uh, people with money to much more practical considerations uh, of women's clothing. And um, that was very clear in your presentation today. Um, one of the viewers wanted to know that uh, about whether or not uh, men wore corsets, um, and our viewer says that uh, men referred to as dandies uh, would often wear corsets. And the question was, did the male physique suffer any damage um, similar to a woman's physique or an, an internal organs? Um, I don't believe to the same extent, and, and I as this viewer pointed out, it really was the dandies, the sort of Beau Brummels of their age who, um, who reverted to wearing a corset. But they didn't get off scot-free. You know, those tall beaver hats were uncomfortable. Those high collars were very uncomfortable as well. Uh, the, the, the tight trousers probably were, were not um, terribly comfortable. Um, so, Yes, they, they, they did undergo some discomfort, but nowhere near the, the problems that women experienced, especially physically. And this is, um, this is an interesting question too. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, this viewer points out that part of a fashionable ladies' day 
would be spent unloosened from her corset. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any letters or do you have any um, discussion, uh, diary entries, that sort of thing, um, about women talking about taking a break from being confined in underwear? I, I have better than that. I have a few tea gowns in my collection. That's what they were called, tea gowns that women wore and they, they were unrestricted. They were very loose flowing robes that a woman might wear, say in the late afternoon between tea time and, and dinner time. Um, and, and that was one of the things that I found very interesting about Lucille Duff Gordon. She took those tea gowns and took them out of doors so that instead of being restricted to just uh, boudoir wear, where no one would be able to see her except her husband and children, women could take that same fashion, that loosened sense of, of, of flow uh, out into the world. And that's what made her so special. Yeah, that, um, boy, <laughs> what a relief it must have been to come to the end of a day. Um, can, you, can you imagine? And, and you know, no. women, women would change their wardrobe five or six times a day if they were women of a certain caste. You know, it wasn't just that they got into the corset in the morning and stayed in those clothes all day. They would, they would be changing clothes all, all day long. Um, and none of those would be any less restrictive, except for that hour, maybe, when they would be uh, allowed to wear that tea gown. Well, and picking up on Brooke's talk, um, when uh, Nellie Bly uh, announced she'd only need a little bag to go around the world, uh, people were shocked. Um, how could you have such a, a limited wardrobe at your disposal? I, I think uh, it, it was amazing to know what, what Nellie Bly accomplished, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, another viewer, wants to know, and actually uh, a couple of viewers uh, voice the same interest, and that is, is there or are there general histories that one can consult to find out more about the evolution uh, of women's undergarments? I mean, certainly um, the astute viewer will come back to your talk again and again, but um, apart from that, are there any biographies? or histories. <laughs> there, there are, and, and also there have been some wonderful exhibits. Um, <clears throat> the Victorian Albert had a wonderful exhibit uh, some years ago on women's undergarments specifically, and they came out with, um, with a book uh, describing the evolution of women's undergarments in the, in the 18th and 19th century particularly. So yeah, the, those, those kind, that kind of information is out there. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another viewer, um, actually, again, more than one, <clears throat> would like to know more about your collection. Um, uh, just what does it consist of? What is the size? Um, does it, it, from what you've said, it, it sounds as though um, it extends beyond um, paper ephemera, for example. But what about your collection? Do you have another hour? I <laughs> <laughs> Last, we don't. Well, yes, it does extend beyond the paper ephemera. I, I love the, the ephemera, the, the advertising, the promotional materials, both trade cards and larger pieces. Uh, but I do have quite an extensive collection of women's garments. And in that um, near the end, that, that slide I showed of all those boxes, those are all corset boxes and that wonderful uh, corset model of, of the grace uh, corset. Um, so I've, I've been fascinated by this whole concept of, of women's undergarments and the contradictory messages that sent over the years. Um, I, I collect many things uh, aside from, uh, from ephemera. Uh, as you saw, uh, I have a, an abiding fascination for Queen Victoria, despite her, despite her warts, <laughs> warts and all. I, I love her. I find her life fascinating, um, and, and many other things. Another question uh, that just came in, actually, mm -hmm. uh, breaking news, breaking even news. as we come on the air. Okay. Um, did women, did bloomers rather, help women participate in sports other than cycling? 
And the allied question to that is, were women, were women allowed to abandon courses uh, during pregnancy? Uh, well, the second part first, um, they, they actually wore corsets and, uh, until, and, and you know, loosened them throughout their pregnancies. And towards the end, um, when they were about to give birth, they, they would abandon them entirely. But it, they were, listen, corsets were considered a healthful uh, article of apparel. So it wasn't, they, they weren't considered um, inadvisable for women, whether they were pregnant or not. They, they, it, it was felt that this was helping women um, get, through, get through life in the most helpful way. Um, as far as women participating in other sports, well, yes, women did play tennis, um, but then again, you see them playing tennis in long trailing skirts and they might've been wearing corsets uh, underneath them. Um, <clears throat> I can't think of what other sports women might've participated in wearing bloomers. I don't know, maybe somebody out there can, can help me along with that. Well, you've eliminated our notion of, of women's undergarments, how they've uh, developed over the years, how this was clearly um, a freeing development for women. And we all thank you very much. And I'll end by reading you one of the comments from one of our, our viewers. And that is simply, and uh, very complimentarily, a familiar but spectacularly presented story with amazing use of ephemera. Thank you. Isn't that Thank lovely? You, Barbara. Thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Barbara, absolutely outstanding. And, and we do thank you most sincerely. Well, folks, we've reached the end of today's presentations. And I, I think these two exceptional and well done presentations are a wonderful introduction to uh, our coverage of this topic, which will continue next March. We trust that you have found the time today well spent. Thank you so much for joining with us, all of you who did. And please do also plan to participate in our full online conference of which this is the beginning Women Challenging Expectations this coming March. Information and registration, full details are available at ephemerasociety.org. As Edward R. Murrow used to say, good night and good luck.